it's often the first thing that people look at when they wake up. It's the last thing they see before they go to bed. When you're working, you have to make a commitment to yourself that I am not looking for distractions. That's just not what I'm here to do. I'm here to work and get things done. In terms of productivity, it would give you amazing peace of mind if you had a, a brain dump to-do list where you put everything that you need to get done on, on one list. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another very special, as always, Next Level University weekly live podcast, week number 73, how to set yourself up to do more in less time. So as Alan was mentioning, mentioning in the preamble, we are in a very busy time where the opportunities are truly, truly endless, but at the end of the day, you can only accomplish what you accomplish. And there's a lot of distractions and there's a lot of things that we should be getting done that we might not be. And today we're going to talk about productivity and how to actually get more done in what hopefully will be less time. So the quality of your life is going to be correlated to how much you can accomplish in the time you're given. We all have 24 hours a day. We sleep eight hours, hopefully, and that leaves 16 hours left. And then Kevin and I use three of those hours for recharge for r and you have to put your iPhone on the charger so that you can recharge the battery. We all have to learn how to recharge our own batteries. Today is going to be about peak performance, about productivity, about how to set yourself up. Set yourself up for success. And the first thing that I want to just kind of frame here is 100 years ago, I would have had to... We have a team member in Italy. His name's Alessandro. And I can text him right now. Happy birthday, Alessandro. Happy, is it really? Mm-hmm. Holy crap. Happy birthday, Alessandro. I should have known that. I can WhatsApp him right now, and he would get it within seconds, and then I can get a reply from him within seconds. A hundred years ago, I would have had to write a letter. I would have had to had that letter go on a ship, go to Italy, and then several months later, I might get a letter in return. And so what I really want everyone to really understand here is that the internet didn't really exist on the mass scale 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Now we've sped the treadmill up so much, it's not even funny. We all have a computer in our pockets at all times if you do have a smartphone, and we have an interconnected global marketplace. Because of that, the amount of distractions, the amount of solicitations on your time and attention has, has proliferated to such a great extent. So before we dump, jump into the principles here, what has your attention controls your life because what you do is predicated on what has your attention right now Kevin and I have your attention if you're watching or listening to this so you are literally being influenced by Kevin and I and that's actually why you showed up but all the other distractions in your life they're not necessarily helping you be more productive and it's really important to understand that so what Kevin and I are going to do is is equip you with the tools to not just dial down the treadmill because you can't just go forever without eventually like running out of steam. We want to dial back the treadmill a little bit so that we're not spinning our wheels and we want to create a redesign the treadmill to be effective towards your unique core values, your unique dreams and goals so that you can finally feel like you're making progress rather than just spinning a mouse wheel. Mouse wheel. Mm Mm-hmm. I've been stuck on that mouse wheel before. Oh, for sure. You know? Okay, so I'm going to talk about the first point. Let's do it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, You dig that? (laughs) So Alan's going to talk a lot about different things and different ways to change your behavior and the things that go into that. I want to talk a little bit about perception. So the other day, Taryn got home from work, and she said, hey, how was your day? And I said, I had a great day. Like, I feel like it was one of those days, babe, where I know I got a lot of things done, but I don't feel like I really did anything. And luckily that day, I literally had my to-do list up, which is just a a Google Doc with a bunch of check, it's like a checkbox to-do list. And I went through, and as I did my day, I checked things off, I checked things off, I checked things off. But I think it's an important thing to understand that if you're not actively measuring your progress, it's not going to feel like you're actually getting anything done. Mm -hmm. So if you're an entrepreneur, you know this, maybe you work a job where every time you do something, you get three things thrown back at you. So the other day I had a call with a client and this client wanted us to do some stuff on his website as well as get him on other podcasts. Awesome. Love that. Love the opportunity to help. Amazing. I had to set up a call with somebody to 
figure out what's the deal with the website. What do we have to know going in? What are the questions we have to ask? What do we have to make sure we know? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. That was a half hour. Then we had the call, which was an hour. And then after I had to figure out, okay, how much does it cost to get them on the shows? What's the process for that? What's the system? What's the website? There's another half hour. So that one hour call ended up being two and a half to three hours of my day. If I didn't write those things down, I would probably assume that I didn't get very much done. And what my goal for you guys is, is to figure out like, what are you actually doing? How are you measuring your progress? We are so, so, so quick to measure every single one of our small losses. We tend not to focus on our small wins. So me doing a pre-call with somebody before that client was a win. That's something I did. That's something I did that day that if I didn't give myself credit for, I might assume that I didn't accomplish anything. So the first thing here, and you can take this throughout everything that we're going to talk about, actually measure your progress. I don't think human beings are naturally good at that. So I think that's a, a good first tip to start with. And I know that that was one of those days where I was very reactive. I got a message from a client who needed something changed. Okay, let's get that changed. This is a potential client. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this call. When I got to the end of the day, I realized the progress I made today might not seem like I made a ton of progress today, but I made it in the near future and the not so near future as well. Right, because the system that he set up with that one client for the getting on other shows, that system that you've established, now we can use that yep. for other clients. Now we can replicate. Whereas if you didn't have that understanding, you might think it wasn't that productive of a day because it went off the rails, but yet you set up the entire future of our business for more success than you can probably understand. I we am, can understand. I am quite amazing. You are? No. <laughs> I, I think it's important that you understand what does productivity actually mean? So like, it depends on the priority, right? But like from your perspective, when you think of productivity, what does that actually mean? It means how much you accomplish. How much are you able to... For me, it's a return on investment. So you only have so much time, effort, and what you're doing with your time and effort, whether it's think, thinking, communicating with others, or actually doing actual tasks, is how much, how much of a return do you get. But that return compounds forever. You put $100 in an investment account, it can compound interest forever if you put it in the right investment account. And so that's what I consider productivity. I think some people think of productivity as, a, uh, okay, I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish today, whereas I think that's the wrong way to approach it. So I'll give a, a tangible example to answer your question. Bill Gates spent a lot of time alone in a dark room coding DOS. And that was like a really tough year. But that set, DOS, was the original software that created Microsoft. So if he looked at that month, he probably would have felt like really not that productive because he didn't really have much to show for it. Mm. But if you fast forward 50 years from now, Microsoft is one of the most successful companies in the history of the world. And so you got to understand like what is the long-term leverage of what I'm doing today? And is it is it a brick that's going to build this building over time, if that makes sense? Makes sense. Strong right. work. Thank you, brother. Of course. All right, so the next one we have, next principle. So the first principle, again, was actually measure your progress. Work. My principle, all MBTs need to be in one place. What's an MBT? An MBT is a most valuable task. And remember, what's most valuable is completely predicated on your unique goals and dreams. Because if you want to be a bodybuilder, obviously weight training matters more than running. If you want to be a marathoner, obviously running matters more than weight training. Right? So it's all predicated on that. So I was sitting down having breakfast. Emilia and I, in the new home, we basically have this little spot where we do our pre-workout ritual. And we have something, uh, simple carbs, and we have some caffeine, and we kind of talk, and we get ready for the gym. She and I were talking, and I was basically like, okay, sweetie, so um, I have to, I owe her some money, so I have to transfer her some money into her new bank account. And I basically me messaged her, or not messaged her, talked to her about that and said, I need your routing numbers. And she's like, she started doing it right then. And I'm like, oh, sweetie, you don't have to do that right now. You don't have to do that right now. And she's like, no, I have to do it right now. Otherwise, I'll forget. And I said, sweetheart, do you not have like one place where you put your tasks so that you can set it and forget it? And she's like, well, no, because I use Google Tasks and I also use Google Spreadsheets and I also use my, my journals. And I said, sweetheart, um, in terms of productivity, it would give you amazing peace of mind if you had a, a brain dump to-do list where you put everything that you need to get done on, on one list. 
So this principle is all of your tasks, all of your to-dos need to be on one rolling list. And she's actually since done that, by the way. There's different categories, but they're all on iCloud Notes. All of my to-dos and Amy's to-dos are on iCloud Notes. So Kevin and I, every Monday, we get together, and there's always things that come up of like, oh, we really should do that. We really should do that. We have a lot of ideas. I have several new things on my rolling to-do list today, but I'm not doing them now. Kevin and I are focused on Monday on recording content. We're not focused on those tasks. So, But I need to put them down somewhere so that I'll remember them later. So do you have one place where you know nothing will slip through the cracks? That doesn't mean you do everything on the list, and I'm going to explain that more later. But at least you know that it won't slip through the cracks unless you consciously decide, you know what, that's not relevant anymore. And another thing about having everything on one list is sometimes you can cross multiple things off with a, a very similar action. Like if you you have to respond to three emails, like while you're in your email, yeah. it's way easier to just hammer them out while you're already there. Right. I did that this morning. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Number two for me, you will hear a lot of people say that you cannot multitask. I actually believe you can multitask. You just can't multi-focus. What does that mean? Mm. <laughs> Alan knew I was going to say that. <laughs> so think of it this way. When you're driving a car and you're having a conversation, you're multitasking. Like you can do that. When you're um, doing the laundry, Alan was listening. What book were you listening to? Oh, uh, Ryan Holiday's ego is the enemy ego is the enemy so the point i'm making here is you can have it stack if you really really want to get productive take time where you're doing something that doesn't take a lot of your cognitive function doing laundry doing the dishes i used to do this back in the day when i was mowing the lawn i would literally put in my airpods i would put on the headphones the noise canceling headphones over and i would listen to a book it was usually Gary Vee back in the day. So there's times throughout your day where you're doing stuff that doesn't require a ton of your attention. You can use that to learn. Now, I think what happens is people try to do that paired with something that's difficult. So like when Alan and I are in the studio and we're working, we might have waves on like a, a calming beach scene on the TV above us, or we might have classical music on, or we might have something like that on. I very rarely have something where I'm actually trying to learn and work at the same time because I'm not able to focus on multiple things. But I, I do believe like, uh, was it Jim Rohn? Turn your car into a classroom? Oh yeah. That's something that Alan definitely imparted wisdom on me years ago. And every time I get in my car, I try for at least half of the ride to listen to something educational. Um, I don't know, you know, a lot of us probably aren't traveling as much as we were, might not be commuting to work, but anytime you are doing something where it's like, look, this sucks, folding clothes, hate it, huge fan of not folding clothes. Anytime I have the opportunity to do that and Taryn's not home, I'll put something on. Or I was doing it the other day and I was watching our mentor Dave Meltzer on Tom Bilyeu's show. Mm. Like Tara and I were watching that together while folding clothes. So anytime you are doing something where you can turn off your brain and complain, you can turn your brain on and learn at the same time. That was fire. I fire one-liner. I was actually folding clothes last night, and I was listening, like you said, to Ego is the Enemy, and it made it made folding clothes more meaningful. Because for me, I value my brain mo far more than my ability to fold clothes, and so it, it made it more meaningful, but someone has to do it, right? So... Uh, that's a really powerful what distinction. Are, what are the hardest clothes for you to fold? Do you do Emilia's as well? I do. Yeah, the shirts. Oh, my goodness. The, the, the sh some of the shirts are very difficult. Right. Yeah, it's very yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking about that last night where it's like I've some of these things I've never... Yeah, I will show. I can show you. Taryn taught me a trick. I can show it to you. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Um, okay, so the next principle, productivity power hours. I remember I was on the phone with an NLU team member, shout out to Crystal, and her system, I basically said, I've done peak performance tracking with dozens of people at this point, team members, clients, group coaching, and I've done it with myself for years. And I, I notice common patterns of how to effectively help people become more consistent. And I said, if you'll just trust me. First, I kind of asked, like, have you ever been as consistent as you want to be? And she's like, well, no. Um, and after that, it's like, do you believe that I have a higher awareness of how, it, how to be consistent? And she's like, yes. I said, okay, do you... Do you trust me to set your system up for success? I promise you, if you trust me and give me permission, and you promise me you won't change the system without my, without talking to me, I promise you in the next two to three weeks, you will feel more productive than you ever have in your entire life. She said, yes, let's do it. Awesome. Literally, last week, I was talking to her, and she literally is the most on fire she's ever been. 
she feels like she's accomplishing more than she ever has. And I also did recommend a book called Essentialism, so I don't want to take all the credit. Um, Greg McKeon, Essentialism, unbelievable book. Very, very good for productivity. Um, and it goes to what I said earlier about how the treadmill is sped up. You can't get it all done, and you got to be a, an essentialist. That's a whole other topic. But basically, she has productivity power hours within her system. What does that mean? She has three of them. There's power hour one, power hour two, and power hour three. This is not the type of power hours that I used to do in college. <laughs> These are productivity power hours. She has two in the early afternoon, one in the late afternoon, after she checks in with Amy, another team member. So she has some accountability built in. What a power hour is, is basically one hour at her desk in front of her computer doing actual work. If we actually could sit down for an hour and not be distracted by reactive things and actually get real work done consistently, you would be shocked at how much you could get done. I track my power hours. Uh, I call them 60-minute uh, jam sessions. I used to do 90-minute, and now my life's a little crazier, so I went down to 60 minutes on my system. But basically, the idea is this. It's a super simple one. How often are you alone in solitude, sitting at your desk in front of your computer, being productive, doing real, tangible, important work? Because a lot of us are running around all day, every day, reacting to our phone, reacting to our email, reacting to Facebook and social media, and we're not actually getting real work done. Whereas if we did get two, three, maybe four power hours in where we were focused, then we would actually have the permission slip that we need to go enjoy Netflix, to go enjoy texting, to go enjoy... I, uh, I heard recently that the new generation coming up sends 4,000 texts a month. Do you remember when you had to pay per text message? Do you oh that? my god! Yeah, uh, my yeah. One, <laughs> one month, my mom was like, "How much did you text?" And it was, it was like eight hundred or something. She's like, "That's going to cost us like several hundred dollars." I'm going to need you to not do that. And I was like, "That's that's how we talk." Yep, that's it. That's it, man. Oh, you're good. Yeah. Okay. I I think um. What do you think the biggest shift in terms of productivity for you was? Was it a deeper understanding of something, or was it a behavior thing? Belief change. Which one? Uh, essentialism. So I heard this quote, if you want to be a maximalist, you have to become a minimalist. And so the belief that shifted was I, I can do it all. I took, I got rid of that completely. And now it's basically what I used to believe is there's time for everything. Now what I believe is there is time if I'm disciplined for the most important things. That one shift, I, I no longer try to get it all done. I never will. I never, I never will again. I instead realize that there's certain tasks that are, that are far more important. And I'll, I'll give an example to answer your question as well. Um, when Emilia and I aren't aren't ten out of ten, and we talked about this actually last night because we had a challenging conversation on Friday night, and I'm like, babe, even when we're a nine point nine, nothing else matters as much. It's like hard for me to go work effectively when her and I aren't good because that's what matters most. And so let's say we had a challenging conversation and I want to get us from a 9.9 back to a 10 out of 10. It's more effective for me to go have that conversation with her than to try to do a power hour because the power hour won't be as effective because I'm worried about my relationship. Whereas if I go talk to her first and get that accomplished or, or, or uh, do that first, now the power hour will be effective. So... Productivity is fluid, and you have to understand in advance, I'm never going to get it all done, but I can get the most important things done knowing that the most important things shift from day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. Mm. You So Alan mentioned solitude, and that's one of the points I have here. So this might be a little controversial, um, but I see a lot of people that want to take their laptops to the coffee shop or they want to take their laptops to the beach or to the pool or wherever it may be. Just understand that the odds of you being as productive out in nature or at the beach where there's a ton of distractions and you don't have great Wi-Fi is probably way less. I know it looks sexy to say like hashtag laptop lifestyle when you're at the beach, but like you're probably not getting as much done as you are hoping. Um, that's just something that I see a lot of people do. I had a buddy reach out recently and he was on vacation and he invited me and it's like, of course I'd like to go. Like, it would be nice to hang out by the lake, you know, and I know there's Wi-Fi there, but it's not the same. It's just not the same as me sitting either in the studio or at the office at home. I remember the most productive time in my life ever 
was when Alan and I lived in Florida. We lived in Florida for the entire month of December. I don't know, pre-COVID, I think it was three years ago. And it was literally wake up, go to the gym, eat turkey and rice for breakfast, jam session, jam session, jam session, eat turkey and rice for lunch, jam session, jam session, eat turkey and rice, uh, rice for dinner, and then maybe hang out for a couple hours. But there was just no distractions. There was just nothing to do. It was just fitness, build the business, learn. Yeah, that was a huge springboard for It was us. a very big springboard. We and should never have seen it. Aquaman. No, Aquaman is <laughs> definitely the worst movie <laughs> the I've worst ever seen movie in my entire life. Ever. But it was one of those things of like, the, the purpose of us going down there was to work. When you go to the beach, you don't go to the beach to work. Right. Work comes second to the beach. So again, you do you, but I do believe that you will be way more productive. Like Alan just said, wake up and do a 90-minute jam session and get as much stuff humanly possible done in 90 minutes and then go to the beach. Right. Because you're going to get way more done in that 90 minutes than you're going to get in three hours sitting on the beach with your laptop drinking a mimosa or whatever people drink. And you won't feel guilty. Right. You give yourself the permission slip with productivity. So if you did three hours of real work in the morning and then you ended up spending five hours at the beach, that you'll actually get more done if you sit in your office in solitude for the first three hours and then go to the beach for five hours than if you went to the beach and tried to work for eight hours. Genuinely. And, and that's huge because then at the beach, at least you won't feel guilty the whole time when you're distracted all day. Yeah. Remember, the goal is to feel good about yourself and, and, and you can do that through self-discipline. I believe that so, so, so strongly. I, I should say to feel fulfilled. That, that's what I would rather say than to feel good about yourself. Fulfillment is the goal. Hello, hello, I'm Sarah Pringle and I need to give the biggest shout out to Kevin Allen at Next Level University. These two men are the most incredible superheroes you will ever meet. They are changing the world and they have the biggest heart and care so much. Kevin Allen, I can't thank you enough for how much you have poured into me and how much belief you've instilled in me. I've always had a dream of becoming a speaker and never thought this was possible and now I see so much of a future ahead of me. You guys, life is short and you only have one life. You have so much on your path. Please surround yourself with people that are gonna support you and lift you higher. I say this with so much caring in my heart. Honestly, I recommend Kevin Allen in, to everyone to meet and, and to grow. And I, before I cry, thank you guys so much from the bottom of my heart. All right, um, I didn't ex actually intend on saying this, but I think this is important. If you're out there listening right now or watching this, you want a better life. You want to get to the next level. You wouldn't be here at Next Level U if you didn't. Next level. In order to get better results, you actually have to learn how to be more productive. Results don't just come by chance. They come as a result of you becoming more, becoming more capable. And, and this is somewhat of a controversial topic, but if you're more capable every single day and you can accomplish more in less time and you work at the on the NLU team you will be valued at a higher level when it comes to our business goals and the people who are the most capable of accomplishing as much as possible in the short amount of time and they're the most effective they're going to be the ones who are more valued to the business now of course there's people like our hearts Kevin and I's hearts value everyone equally but our minds in terms of business goals, there's certain people who are more productive than others. The goal should be to become more capable. I made $7.25 an hour when I was 15 years old, 16 and a half, 16 and a half years old, because I did drive there, so I knew I had my license. Why is it that now I make $150 an hour regularly? Why is it that Kevin and I got paid $1,800 for one hour of our time? Is it because I'm intrinsically better? I mean, I wasn't a bad person at 16 and a half. I'm way more capable now. I'm way more valuable now because I learned how to become more valuable. I learned how to become more productive. I learned how to become more capable. I have more skills. I know more. I have more knowledge. People don't like this topic. It's so important. Intrinsically, you're all super valuable. But to the marketplace, a.k.a. money, you are not equal. No one is. Right? Steve Jobs was more capable than me. That's why he made more money. And if you don't understand that, 
He was one of the most productive humans on the planet. And that's why he was so successful. And so I just want to remind everyone, your life's results, health, wealth, love, if someone's in better shape than you, they probably are more productive in the fitness arena. They're more effective in less time or they invest more time. If someone's wealthier than you, they are most likely more productive in terms of money, financial acumen, business, career. If someone has a more successful relationship than you, it is because they are more productive in their relationship. Check-ins, difficult conversations, communication skills. So I just want to reiterate that. Productivity, I don't think a lot of people understand that the, the quality of life that you enjoy every single day is actually a byproduct of your productive output. It's a byproduct of your progress. It's a byproduct of, of how much you can accomplish. I think that's an important important thing to say. Thank you. Because I think productivity sound th- it's kind of a sexy thing now. Like people talk about it more, and I don't know that people understand the underlings of what it actually means. Right, and what you can get from it. Yeah. So I don't know if you're out there right now. You might be a wizard, like my wonderful partner Taryn, and you might not have to set a timer when you bake cookies or you bake things because you just know when things are done. That's not the way I roll. I will burn a lot of things. If I do that, but when you cook things, you set a timer. Why? Because you know when those things are done. If you find yourself being quote unquote unproductive because you are getting lost in the sauce of social media, believe it or not, your smartphone, I know the iPhone does, I don't know if Android does, but the iPhone literally has a timer that you can set where it says, look, I'm going to give myself a half hour of Instagram today. I'm going to give myself a half hour of Facebook, a half hour of LinkedIn, of Pinterest, of TikTok, of whatever else, YouTube, whatever else, like whatever other apps there are. So many of us are consuming more than we are producing. So Alan and I produce seven episodes a week, and we have a team that does the actual production of it, but we produce in terms of creating the content, We produce coaching calls. We produce team calls. We don't have that much time to be consuming. Mm. There's just not a lot of extra time for us to be getting lost down the rabbit hole of social media. And I know if you're out there, you're probably the same. I had this talk with one of my clients the other day. I said, okay, let's be real. Like, let's have a real, real conversation about this. How many hours a day are you losing to social media? And I said, when I say losing, I mean not posting for your business, not building relationships, not doing something constructive, productive. And she said, I don't know, probably like two and a half, three hours. That's a lot of time to be losing on social media. That's like the potential to get three new clients. That's the potential to learn. You could literally listen to an entire audio book in that time. So I helped her reframe. I said, look, set a timer. Let's start with a half hour. Let's start with an hour, like whatever is going to be a small improvement. But if you struggle with that, do all of your social media stuff first thing and then get rid of your phone. One of the things that has really genuinely helped me, and again, it gives me anxiety to do this, so that's you know a sign that something is wrong. I literally have a charger across the room where I will go plug my phone in and I'll leave it. My, my laptop is away from my phone. So if I'm doing work, if I am prepping for a client, if I'm doing something for the team, if I'm doing finance stuff, whatever, I don't have the opportunity to be distracted. We have this thing that is a form of distraction in our pockets, like on our person 24-7. It's often the first thing that people look at when they wake up. It's the last thing they see before they go to bed. When you're working, you have to make a commitment to yourself that I am not looking for distractions. That's just not what I'm here to do. I'm here to work and get things done. Very similar to what Alan said. You know, productivity is something that is going to determine your success. And the more productive, I almost jeffed that word, you are as a human being, the more opportunities you will have in the long run. So there's two people, producers and consumers. Produce more and consume less. Unless consuming is going to help you produce, but for most people, it's just a welcome distraction. If you're doing something that you enjoy, you don't want a welcome distraction. There are no welcome distractions. Maybe your kid or your partner coming home is a welcome distraction. You can hug them and say, hey, I hope you had a wonderful day. I'm in the middle of something. I'll be right with you. Sure. But when it comes to text messages, when it comes to notifications, all of that jazz probably isn't super good for you. Last thing I will say, I can literally tell how focused somebody is by how quickly they respond to my message. I, there's people out there that I can message right now and they will get right back to me. Not a good sign. That means they're waiting for something to react to. 
So if people are telling you, I've seen this meme going around of like, if he or she cares about you, they'll get right back to you. Not true, particularly if somebody's out there chasing their dreams. Sometimes there's just other things that are more important. Sometimes the priority is something else. Priority, that word. I'm going to paint a picture for everyone out there to, to help everyone understand that it's not just your productivity that's taking a hit, it's, it's your quality of life. Uh, Emily and I meal prep every Sunday. And Crystal's the marketing director at NLU, amazing, doing amazing things. And she basically said, like, the meal prep, you should really consider um, showcasing that. People want a meal prep. It's, it's awesome. And she basically suggested I get a dummy phone that isn't connected to the Internet so that I can take content and then use it later because I don't want – I basically said I don't want my phone to be with us when we're doing our lifestyle optimization, when we're having our Sunday evening together. So imagine this. So I have I have my phone. There's only four people that can get a hold of me at any time. My mother, Kevin, Amy, and Emilia. Those are the only four people where my phone will actually ring right now. Um, and by the way, those four people know not to call me unless it's something urgent. Uh, now, I'm going to paint a quick picture. It's Sunday night. Emilia and I are meal prepping. And we have a love song playlist on Spotify that we add to over our relationship it's it's got all of our favorite love songs on it and uh, I hope to play it at our wedding wedding one day and so we're meal prepping and all of a sudden one of my favorite songs of all time is the Beauty and the Beast song and if anyone loves that movie like I do there's the scene in the big hall where they're dancing to the Beauty and the Beast song I stop what we're doing in the meal prep I think I was chopping onions or something and I grab her and we start dancing together and little Tucker's there and we are literally dancing to the entire song together in the middle of a Sunday, just by ourselves in our home. I want you to imagine how beautiful that moment was for us. And I want you to imagine some random telemarketer calls us. And my phone was playing on Spotify to the boombox, the, uh, I don't know if it's Jabra or whatever, Bluetooth thing. And that moment gets smashed because of some telemarketer from Marlboro calling to see if I want some whatever. I am so dogmatic about keeping my attention where it belongs. My attention in that moment belongs on Emilia, not on some telemarketer from Marlboro. Put your phone away. I have a charger outside of our bedroom because I don't want my phone in the bedroom. You need to create barriers. Imagine someone knocking on your glass every day, all day when you're trying to work. It's the same as these digital leashes that we have. It is so important for each and every one of you to realize how much productivity and quality of life you are losing. I know that unless it's Kevin, Amy, my mother, or Emilia, it couldn't be Emilia, I'm not going to have that beautiful moment interrupted. I danced the entire song. Nobody called, right? And even if they did, the music would keep playing. So it's really important to set your phone up for success. Set your email up for success. Don't have 50 tabs open on your computer. Single task. Focus on the things that are essential. Don't, Kevin and I did an episode today on regret. If you, no one's going to be 70 years from now on their deathbed and say, I really wish I had focused on more inessentials. I really wish I had gotten back to text quicker. I really wish that I had like allowed more telemarketers to get a hold of me. No one's, you know what I mean? So it's just really important to, to create a bubble of silence of quality of life around you. I'm telling you, your life will improve drastically. I was at the bank the other day. I told Alan this and um, hmm. she's like, yeah, I just need to talk to Alan so we can like, you know, do this account thing. And I was like, no, not going to happen. She's like, we could just call him. And I said, no, not going to happen. I said, like, I can text him and maybe he'll get back to me. But like I said, if you want to get a hold of Alan, like it's just not it's not going to happen. Like, so you're, we just have to do it because we're not going to be able to do it. So. That was for a business bank account. Yes. A new new business. bank I, account. A new business bank. account. I think it's also important too. this isn't something I was going to say, but I think it's important to communicate the truth of that. Right. Of like. My mom, my grandmother, my friends, Taryn, every, like you, the team, they, the clients, they understand that like I'm not always going to get right back to you. If you call me, the odds of me answering the phone are pretty low mm. just because it's not, if it's not, now if Taryn's driving or something, I will because I don't know, you know, maybe something went wrong. But my priority is my productivity in that moment. I think we just have to make it known of like, hey, at, from this time to this time, I'm unavailable. 
Like I'm just unavailable. I'm, I'm not going to be available to respond to emails or calls or whatever it may be. And I think we just have to set up boundaries. Tanner and I are going away next week. I've already blocked off my calendar. Like you will not be able to get a hold of me. Mm-hmm. It just won't, it won't happen. So, and I know that in advance. Yeah. Everybody he told knows. me that weeks ago. Like yeah. I will not be available from here this time to this time. But you have to have that boundary because people, I mean, think of it. If people don't have the same boundary as you do, they're going to push yours. So you have to determine what your boundary is and you have to set it and then you have to to stay committed to that because people will take your time and sometimes it's for great things. Maybe it's to, to you know give you good news, but maybe that's not what you want in that moment. So have the audacity to, to set those boundaries. I think it's very important. So, so, so important. I, I used this analogy one time in book club because I was explaining this concept and I said, why can't any of I, I think there was like 10 or 12 people in the 10, room. 10,000 actually. 10,000 book club. Yeah. No, 12 people, something like that. I said, why can't any of us get a hold of Jay Shetty right now? And if you can, by the way, let us know. Please. No, I'm kidding. Please. No, seriously. But I asked them seriously, why can't we get a hold of Jay Shetty? None of us. None of us can. Not on Instagram, not on Facebook, not on email, not on phone call. None of us can get a hold of him. I said, why? Why, why can't we? Right? There's a lot of people that could get a hold of you, each of you. He would lose his mind if everyone could get a hold of him. He has had to protect his consciousness because he's semi-famous. So why aren't we all doing that? We're all, we have a, you know, if you're out there and you have a thousand Facebook friends and you have, I'll never forget this, Emilia had her phone number and her email signature. I said, sweetheart. As you continue to grow and evolve and your business can, grows and evolves, you need to take that out. Honestly, take it out now. You do not want everyone having your phone number. We use WhatsApp because that's a more protective barrier. If you text me, that me, that's different than if you WhatsApp me. It's really important to have a protective moat around your consciousness. Your consciousness is what will build your future. And so I asked them, is it because Jay Shetty doesn't love people? They're like, no, Jay Shetty obviously loves people. Doesn't he want to help people? They're like, yeah, it's obvious he wants to help people. See, you can't not get a hold of Jay Shetty because he's mean and selfish. You can't get a, a, a hold of Jay Shetty because he wants to be productive. He wants to do real meaningful work. He's probably writing his book, his next book, right? You can't write a book and text people back. That's not a thing. So, yeah, that's an important distinction as well. Is like, it's not, you're not a bad person for creating these, these boundaries. You're actually an intelligent person for doing it. I'm just going to hammer my last thing really quick. Um, I was talking to a friend, I don't know, it was probably, I don't know, a year year and a half ago, and we were talking about mowing the lawn. And I said, honestly, uh, with all the love in the world, you're quite literally wasting your money by not paying somebody to mow your lawn. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're somebody who gets clients, like that's one of the things you do or you are prospecting for something, right? You're reaching out and building relationships based on that possibly ending up in an exchange of money. If you are doing stuff, so Dave Meltzer says this, there's activities you get paid for and there's activities you don't get paid for. A lot of us are spending a lot of time doing things that we don't get paid for when we could pay somebody else to do that and then make money through our channel, whatever that means. So, Alan and I, for instance, say I had a yard. I don't because we live in a complex, so we don't. But I would literally pay somebody $30 an hour to pay the lawn. And with that $30, I would try to build relationships on social media. Or I would podcast. Or I would do a coaching call and make $150 for the hour. And then that way, I can actually pay somebody and still I would make $120 in that hour. I think a lot of us are thinking, well, that costs me money. Yes, it does in the short term, but if you think about it, if you were to get one client during that time where that person is mowing your lawn, then you're going to make money on that. Part two of this, you're actually helping somebody else out. Yeah. You're helping somebody. So I had this written down. Stay in your genius zone. You're actually helping somebody stay in their area of genius. If somebody has a landscaping company, that is what they're the best at. So I will let them do that while I do some podcast coaching or I do some podcasting or some speaking or whatever it may be. So I think it's that that deeper understanding that yes, you're spending money, but you're spending money to buy time back where you can actually make more money doing what you love. So I think that's an important distinction. Very last thing, we'll move to Q&A. I have a client uh, right now who makes $5,000 for marketing and branding support for her clients. 
if she is mowing her own lawn. Remember, this person's really, really talented. She's gone to school. She's done exceptional things. She's studied and practiced, and she's got a lot of years of perfecting her craft. A lot of people can shovel. A lot of people, when I, okay, I'll do this. When I was a cart kid at a golf course, I made $7.25 an hour. There's not a lot of people who can't be a cart kid. I didn't have that many skills. So the same goes for the mowing your own lawn thing. It's not against anybody. There might be a high school kid who needs that job, just like me at one point, just like Kevin at one point. So this isn't anything negative against anyone, but my client, if you make $5,000 for getting a client and you spend two hours on a Sunday mowing your own lawn when you could have been prospecting, I want you to take $4,700 and burn it. See, you're thinking of what you're spending, not what you could make. Start thinking in terms of opportunity cost. I understand barbecues are more fun than going to the gym. I get it. But if you want to be in shape, one of them is more valuable. And we all know the answer. So again, it's not always fun to hear the truth, but it is the truth. And uh, we are happy to, to give it. That's what it takes to get to the next level. Can you just ex- real quick explain opportunity cost? Yeah, opportunity cost is thinking one layer deeper than, okay, if I spend $30 on this high school person to mow my lawn and I make $4,700 if I get a new client with that same time, then the opportunity cost is $4,700 because $4,700 plus $300 is $5,000. So hopefully that makes sense. Math with Jeff and Jeff. Oh, yeah. Boom. Boom.